And I'm going to begin to read from verses 6. Philippians 4, beginning from verse 6. I will read from the King James Version, and then I would also make allusions from um, the Contemporary English Version. Be careful for nothing. One scripture says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are holy, sorry, whatever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. These things which you have both had, learnt, and received, and had, and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now I want to read the same scripture from the contemporary English version. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything with thankful hearts. Offer up your prayers and requests to God. Then, because you believe, or sorry, because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control your way, the way you think. This peace will control the way you think and feel. Now, several studies have shown that the way we think governs our perception. That is how we see life. And how we see life governs the outcome of our life. So the way you think allows you to perceive the world around you. And the world around you determines your outcome. And so regardless of whatsoever your outcome now, whatsoever you are having as your outcome, the key of it is the way you think. The way you think. And then he now said, finally, my friends, keep your minds on whatsoever is through. Now, one of the versions says, think of whatsoever is true, pure, right, holy, friendly, and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. Be careful of the way you think and then the way you feel. Now Solomon says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Our thinking influences our feelings or our perception and it also influences our outcome. Now, before I go into about five or six things you need to do about your thoughts, the ultimate desire of God, the ultimate goal of God is that you might have perfect peace. That regardless of whatsoever happens around you, you must have perfect peace. And he was saying that the way you think 
is going to determine whether you are going to have perfect peace or your life is going to be disorderly. Jeremiah told us about the thoughts that God or the thoughts and plans God has for you is to give you hope and to bring you to an expected end. God has a plan and God has thoughts regarding you. And these plans and these thoughts is to ensure that you have peace. But for you to have peace, you must guard your mind in the way you think, which influences the way you feel, and which influences your outcome. You must guard your mind. Let's turn to that Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. You know, when we come to church every morning, I will quote many scriptures, so you need to follow, follow up with us. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I read, For I know the thoughts that I think. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And Philippians told us, for nothing be anxious, but in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your mind. Then he now quickly said, brethren, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is praiseworthy, think on these things. And so your peace and your peace of mind, you know, all is centered on the way you think. Now, when the Bible uses the word peace, it's not talking of quietness the way we look at it. It's talking of a state of balance in your heart and in your mind. That regardless of whatsoever is happening around you, no matter what is besieging you around you, you must have the capability to focus your thoughts so as to extract peace. He's indirectly telling you now, bring every thought you have under captivity that you might have peace. Now, Colossians 3.5 tells us, he says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And it's for this reason you are called in Christ Jesus. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. I don't know if you look at your life and check how your life goes. Do you feel that God's peace is ruling in your life? Then if God's peace is not ruling in your life, then check your thoughts. Your thoughts hold on your perception and it influences the outcome of your life. Second Thessalonians verse chapter 3 verse 16 said, now may the God of peace himself give you peace at all times. May the God of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. So he was saying that the peace you have, nothing should take it from you. But the key to this peace lies in the way you guard your thoughts in Christ Jesus. May the peace of God rule in your heart in every way, in every place. Now, how do you think and how should we think? If you look at the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8, he told us whatsoever is, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is worthy, Whatever is great, think on these things. Now, who in this world, if you turn to Philippians 4, 8, 18, sorry, 4, 8, who is true in this world? Christ. Who is honest in this world? 
Christ. Who is pure in this world? Christ. Who is lovely in this world? Christ. Who, is, who has had a good report? From when he was born and he died? Christ. Who is filled up with virtue? Christ. Who is doing things of praise? Christ. Now, this Paul's list, there is only one person in the world that is like that, and that is Jesus. And Paul can as well say, look, fix your eyes on Jesus. In Hebrews 3, 1, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. In Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, but fix your eyes on Jesus. And so no matter challenges you face, no matter trouble you face around you, fix your eyes on Jesus. Excuse me, please leave them. Leave them alone. Let them just sit down. It's distracting. Fix your eyes on Jesus. No matter these challenges you face, fix your eyes on Jesus. That is it. No matter your challenges, fix your eyes on Jesus. Now Jesus said in the world, in the world you will find troubles. In the world you will find tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so if you are facing the problem in the world, you must be of good cheer. In the early Jesus was saying, regardless of what you are facing in the world, be positive. Regardless of the situation in this world, always think Christ. Always think possibility. Always think that you are going to make it through. And that is how Jesus thought. Now, many studies around the world have shown that if people's minds are fixed on positive things, if people, mind, if people think positively, if people speak positively, they tend to have positive things happen to them. So if you think positively, then you attract positive things. And even research have found out that even your immune system, that is your ability to fight disease, is determined a lot by how you think. If you think negative, your ability to fight disease will be removed. I remember I was in Bristol several years ago. At that time, I was still studying in a, in a place called Bristol Royal in February. And we had two patients with us. One of them had a chest disease, which I considered not so terrible, which I felt that he can easily recover from it. Then there was another one who has another chest disease, which I consider very alarming, very terrible, very challenging. But then what I noticed was that when I went, well, in the, in, the, in the UK or most part of the western part of the world, you're not allowed to preach. But as I got to the man who had this chest disease, I said, oh, uh, sir, you'll be well soon and you'll be discharged. He said, no, 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 no. It's so awful. It's so terrible. The cough is so bad. Well, I'm not allowed to but I'm give a hopeful word. Then I went to another one who had this terrible chest disease. The person was coughing and everything. I just said, well, just keep your medication going. Hopefully things will be well. And I said, he's excited. He sees himself out of this hospital soon. He was very positive. Roll back forward, the patient who had a small chest disease that was saying no more, he died. And while the other one who was so excited and believing that he can do well, he recovered and was discharged. In our local hospital here, I was invited to see a patient. And this was a student in the medical, I think it was a student in the medical rehabilitation, there was a, one of the medical sciences. And this guy had a chest tube because there was a pulse in his chest. And some of this chest, as this disease has spread around part of the body. And it was in the ICU. 
And so he sent for me, although he wasn't a member of our church, he wasn't attending our church, but he sent for me as a church physician. And when I was leaving him, he told me, please, can you pray for me? Now, it's so difficult sometimes to switch from medicine to faith. So at that point, I had to switch from medicine to faith. Because if I were to look at him medically, doctors would say prognosis. We think about prognosis means how can we predict this disease? And I'm saying if a disease has spread, the pulse is there, even though the pulse is being taken, you know, I was almost thinking that he's going to find it difficult to recover. And if he recovers, you have a lot of damage. But when I shift, I looked at him and I asked him, what are your dreams? What do you want to achieve in life? And he told me, look, pastor, I will want to be a pastor. You know, although I am studying here, I want to be a pastor. Then secondly, I will look forward to getting married. And then thirdly, I am trusting God that I will study outside the country. So I now said to him, just close your eyes and keep this dream in your mind. Just forget about the pause. Forget about this chest tube on your chest. Forget about the fact that you are in ICU. Just put your mind on this dream that you are going to be a pastor, you are going to get married, and that you are going to go outside the country. I said, can you picturize it? Do you really believe that these things you have said in your mind is possible? And I said, have you captured this in your thoughts? He said, yes, I've captured it. I said, now I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to focus on your healing. I'm going to focus on these three things you are dreaming on. I'm not going to focus on your chest tube or your pulse. I'm going to focus on these three things you are dreaming of. That you will get married, you get out of this hospital, then you will fulfill your dream as a pastor. I prayed for him. And I really prayed with all my heart. And then I left. I didn't get to see him again until about one or two world rounds. The next time I got to see him, he was schooling here, the next time I got to see him, person to person was in the streets of Allen Avenue in Lagos. As I was passing through the Allen Avenue, the man stopped me and called me, Pastor, do you see my dreams have been achieved? I'm a pastor, I am married. Then I recalled in my mind that you were that patient that was in ICU. Now he focused his thoughts not on his chest tube, but on his dreams. And he believed in his dreams that he will achieve it. And so research have found out that if you focus your thoughts on the positive, your immune system fights back. It has also been found out that if you are very positive, stress, the ability to survive stress and survive stressful situation is reduced. You and everybody in the world have the same stress. But because you are positive in your way of thinking, because you are positive in the way you see life, then you find out that your ability to sustain stress is important. And that's why Jesus said, in the world you will find stress. In the world you will find trouble. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Scripture says in the book of Isaiah, the chastisement of our peace was put upon him. Now what does it mean? If you have no peace, you have chastisement. But the chastisement of our peace was put upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Research have found that those who are positive in their way of thinking have better relational skills. They are able to relate to people properly. They are able to have friends. And they are able to be jolly around yourself. If you give them any job to do at workplace, people like them. What they call the likability index. Because they are likable. And people begin to like them because they are attracting positive things. They are bringing positive, what they call positive vibes. And because they are bringing positive vibes, they are more likely to be approachable. They are more likely to get married. They are more likely to, be, to rise up in a social circle. 
Richards have also found that those who have a positive mindset, they tend to be happier. You see, they, are, they, they just get happy. You can't explain. All around them, they are happy. And their happiness brings a lot of great things upon their life. They make them joyful because positive mindset is like a catalyst. It's like a catalyst. And it makes you happy. Makes you joyful. Muhammad Ali said this. Who was the number one, uh, if, you, if you Google Twitter and ask, the greatest boxing of all time. It will be Muhammad Ali. He said, to be a great champion, you must believe you are the best. If you are not, pretend you are. You must believe you are the best, and even if you are not, pretend you are. And so it has been found out that those people, they tend to be happier. They tend to be joyful. Somebody was once saying that a positive attitude, he's not sure, he's almost 99% sure that a positive attitude will get you to where you are. And he's almost 100% sure that a negative attitude will not get you where you want to go. It is said that a negative attitude is like a flat tire. And where you have it, you go nowhere. Now, let me tell you sincerely speaking, that means you are the composer. You know, you are the composer and conductor of your destiny. And so when you think good, when you think positively, then you get attracted to it. And that is why in that scripture they were telling us that, look, think of what is good. Think of what is true. Think of what is lovely. It is not saying that things will be true and lovely. He's saying think of them. Now before I go into the various ways you should think, let me tell you something which is important. Every single one in this world has rain coming upon it. Who, when rain falls, is there anybody who is spared of rain? Or anybody spared of sun? Nobody, every one of us have rain and sun. And this was Jesus' way of saying that God has no favorite. He said he gives the sun and the rain to everybody. And so you cannot say that there is someone in this world who is having a better opportunity than you are. Then I want to say again, every single person on this earth has his own lane where he's running. Everything, I can tell you truthfully, everything works. No matter how it happens, everything works together for your good. That is the story of my lifetime. Paul said, all the things that have happened to me has happened rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Everything that has happened to me has happened rather to the furtherance of the gospel. You know, in the past, I used to worry. Maybe in church or in my personal life, and I see things not working the way it works. But I, each time I worry, the Lord said, look back at your life. You remember there was a time in your life you felt bad like this. See where you are today. There's a time in your life you felt that there was someone who is so important to your life. And without that, you can't do anything. And you, you, you trusted me. See where you are today. There was a time somebody met you and said, oh, you can't even ride a car. And now I'm riding as more cars than him. More time in London before. So what am I saying is, everything that happens to you because you are called by God is to your good. The man left you in marriage. The woman did not treat you well. Your boss did not treat you well. Or you are a pastor and people abandon you. It's going to work to your good. It's going to work to your good. So think what? Good. Then the thought in always say, think grace. Think grace. Wherever you are faced with any challenge in this life, always think grace. What is grace? Grace means that my grace is sufficient. 
My grace is sufficient. Whatsoever challenges you face in this life, my grace is sufficient. I don't want to tell you this story, and I've told you this story for some of these younger ones doing exam um, in, in school. I was somewhere speaking in a program here in Odudua Hall in Ife. And this lady met me and said she has been told to leave the medical school. And after the message, she just told me, I said she had been told to finish the medical school. And she told me all the things she has gone through in life. Then I asked her, do you still want to study medicine? I said, yes. I said, well, one medical school has rejected you. The whole world has not rejected you. Do you want to believe God with me? That God can turn your situation around. And then in a very simple way, I wasn't having any influence in the university to go and beg for her or go and ask for her to be reinstated in school. In that evening, after my speech in Odudua Hall, I said, let's pray. And then she prayed. And I said, God's grace can make it possible. You know what the Bible said about grace? Grace is able to abound. And so whenever you receive any challenge, grace abounds. Paul said, God multiplies grace. God multiplies grace. And the Bible was talking about when you have a mountain to deal with, grace and grace and grace is deposited. And I prayed for her. I didn't get in touch with her again until I went to the University of Illinois to speak. And then after I finished speaking, one lady, in fact, I couldn't recognize her, ran after me. I said, sir, can you remember me? I was that young girl that felt I'd been rejected. Now I'm in my fourth year in the medical school, and everything is going on well. I will not be surprised if it's not a consultant. Always think grace. God's grace is sufficient in any situation. And so whenever you are faced with any situation, always believe that God will give you grace to take care of it. Then number four, think glory. Always think glory. What is a glory way of thinking? A glory way of thinking is what Paul spoke about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He says, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. You see, someone said you will never be worried about anything in life if your primary reason of living in this life is for God's glory. Where you'll be worried is when you are thinking about yourself. But if you are thinking about God's glory, if you are full up with God's glory, if your desire is to see God exalted, if your mind is to see God lifted up, then you won't, go, you won't, be, you won't be worried. And so whenever you are faced with any challenges or faced with any situation in your life, I want you to think what glory in the book of Ephesians 1, 12, we read, what we should be to the praise of his glory. God wants us to do everything to the praise of his glory. Anything we go on to, we should do it to the praise of his glory. And so say, Father, I want you to be glorified in this situation. Now the situation is bad, but I'm not going to think about that situation. I'm not going to worry about that situation. But I'm going to say, Lord, use this situation to glorify your name. Lord, use these circumstances to glorify your name. As a young man growing, I can say that I inherited several great things from my father. But the greatest one I received, one of the greatest ones I received from my father was when I was still young. My father taught me the Psalms. I read the Psalms, I memorized the Psalms, and he, he kept on telling me this Psalm and teaching us this Psalm, the stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. Think the glory of God. And this is our theme this year, that the Lord will glorify us. The Lord will glorify his name in our life. Jesus says, let your, let your deeds or actions or your works 
so shine that men will see your good works and then glorify God in your life. I want to think the glory of God. When I go for exams, I want to think the glory of God. When I'm into business, I want to think the glory of God. When you give me an assignment, I want to think the glory of God. I tell my friends, I tell my colleagues, for every job you are given on this earth, so do it because you serve an excellent God. Let nothing die in your hands. Let nothing be heard in a shabby manner. Do everything to the glory of God. Do everything to bring God, to make God famous. Do everything to make God wonderful. Do it as if God is in your presence. The book of Ephesians tells us that we are the masterpiece of God. We are the masterpiece of God. Father, I'm your masterpiece. Father, I'm your masterpiece. And so whatsoever I lay my hands to do, my father, I want to do it to your glory. Jesus was asked about a blind man. He said, why is this man blind? Is he his father? Or, or where is he laid? Is he his father? Or is he sin? He said, no, that the Lord might be glorified in him. That should be your motto. Lord, I want you to be glorified in me. Lord, I want to think your glory. Lord, I want to think your glory. Lord, I want to think your glory. Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life. Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life. Whenever they mention my name, let them mention God. Let your testimony be my testimony. Paul said that, that whether by death or by life, Christ must be magnified in me. Whether by life or by death, Christ must be magnified in me. As so when someone sees your life, always think the glory of God. Always think the glory of God. Always believe the glory of God. The stone the builders refuse has become what? The headstone of the corner. And that's exactly how God works. Jacob said, I am a man that came to this world or into this territory with only a stick and nothing. But now God has multiplied me and I'm two bands. I am two bands. I can also say it when I'm in this city. I came here as a young resident. Nothing, just a few ones, one showcase. But how God has expanded. Almost all my friends says, can anything be good found in this city? God can glorify his name in your life. I've always told people that location is important. But more important is whether God locates you. I mean, you can be in a very good location. And if you are not located by God, it's nowhere. They wondered and asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And yet Nazareth was the one that became the masterpiece. When they talked about David, he came from the root of Jesse. And Jesse was not recognized in terms of kingship and lordship. And he was the least of his brothers. But God chose him to glorify his name. Paul said, Look among you, not many brave, not many wise, not many big people, but God has chosen the useless things of the world to make useful. God has chosen the ordinary things of this world to make extraordinary. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound his wise. God has chosen the people who are obscure to make them outstanding. Because you are thinking God's glory. You are thinking God's glory. And I want to say this, that is what you people you see. Whether you are singing, whether you are praying, people can just see the glory of God in your life. People can just see the power of God in your life. People can just see the hands of God in your life. So think glory. Again, I want to say, if you are going to think, think growth. Think growth. That whatever happens to you, Use it to grow up. Whatever happens to you, use it to grow up. Anything that happened in your life, use it to grow up. I've said before, a woman some time ago 
said that there are two kinds of people. One is called the fixed mindset. And the other one is called the growth mindset. The fixed mindset are rigid. They stay where they are. And they see it in that fixed mindset. Then there are other people who have the growth mindset. And whatever happens to them, they use it as an opportunity to grow. They get feedbacks, whether it is positive or negative. And they use those feedbacks to do better. And so I want to say, think growth. Think growth. Every day of my life, I'm always trying to get better. Yesterday, I was involved in a tutorial by someone outside this country. I was listening to him to get better. I listened to about four sermons on YouTube to get better because I want to grow. As whatever happens to you, begin to grow and let the growth of God spur you to greater heights. So no matter what happens, you must always think growth. Lord, let me grow by this situation. Let me be more matured by this situation. Let me be better emotionally matured by this situation. Think growth. Think growth. The Bible says of Jesus Christ that he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Can you imagine that? Jesus is already a known person who was God. He grew by it. He didn't suck. He didn't withdraw. He's not against God. He grew by it. But people are getting involved. Only they do is to Facebook. 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 And now doctors have told us there is something called Facebook addiction syndrome. Facebook addiction syndrome is a new term that has been discovered. It may not be too new, but I know within the last three or four years. Those are people who cannot get satisfaction until they are glued to the Facebook. Their emotional life is bent on the Facebook. They wake up in the morning and they are sad. Their mood is taken care of by the Facebook. And then every now and then they are looking at the Facebook, looking at the Facebook, looking at the Facebook. And what children have, what they call a, a deficient attention, a, a attention deficit, adults are not having it. So they can't focus on anything because they have this Facebook addiction syndrome. Now rather than taking a Facebook addiction syndrome, why not grow? Paul said to Timothy, he said, let no one despise your youth, but be that an example of believer, and he mentioned all things. He, Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved. You know, you can grow. Within one year, you can learn four things. You can learn four skills. That even if you don't have a job in one place, those four things you have learned can give you a job. You grow. Don't defend yourself. Be better than yourself. Don't fight yourself. Grow through the situations that are happening in your life. And let me tell you, get better every day. Think better every day. You can dress better. You can look better. You can speak better. You can write better. You can be better all the days of your life. No one should be able to predict your future by your behavior of now. You must be undergoing continuous metamorphosis or change. Paul said that... They, that we should prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And he now told us, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding. Always abounding. And then Paul, and then Solomon said that a righteous man is looking at something and is growing and growing and growing and growing into the image. So think growth. Are you growing? Are you getting better? Are you getting better? Everyone I meet in this life, I have something to learn from them. And that is why you can never learn if you are talking. Two years, one mouth. You keep listening. Keep listening. And keep growing. I always tell people that the only day you are permitted to fail is the day you fail. 
But people have found that, research have found that, that the pathway to success is always drawn, always passes through the terrace or the, the, the road of failure. Winston Churchill said, he says success is moving from one failure to another failure without losing your enthusiasm. I wrote in one of my books that success is a failure, is a school matter of success. Now, a great man was saying, I can never employ any man in a job if he cannot tell me one problem he has encountered in life and tell me how he solved them. What problem he has encountered in his life and tell me how he solved them. Now, if he has solved that problem, then he can tell me. And never make sure that go to Harvard, go to MIT, go to all the, the great universities. You see, I don't look for Harvard scholars to employ I don't look for uh, Oxford scholars. I look for men who have made problems and mastered them. Simplicity is the essence of greatness. Aban Estee was a dropout. Mark Zuckerberg was a dropout. The founder of Apple was a dropout. Even Escon, the great, the richest man in the world, was, not, was even a dropout. It's not because they dropped out because they failed. It's but because this man Recognize that greatness is not found in the degree you have, but your capacity to use situations and grow through them. Then think gratitude. If you are going to move forward, always think gratitude. Always find something to be thankful for. Always find something to be grateful for. The Bible says, in all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Give thanks. Always find time to give thanks to God. Always give thanks to God. I noticed something about Jesus. And if you read the Bible, you find that it's so common about Jesus. Jesus was always giving thanks. When he was told to multiply the fish and the loaves and there was no money, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and he gave thanks. When he was confronted with Lazarus and they, they needed a supernatural miracle, he gave thanks. I've always found out that when you open the, the one way to open the gates of heaven is by a continual spirit of giving thanks. Some people blame God for putting thorns in the midst of roses rather than thanking God for putting roses in the midst of thorns. Look on the bright side. Find something to be thankful for. Somebody, I told you this story in this church some time ago. A very wealthy businessman was passing through an elevator and his elevator was in America. The man was having his coat, he was sweating, he was worried and he was troubled that the stock exchange is dropping, he's not making enough money. 